Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. On this week's show, Aaron Malyars, Director of Content and Channels for Insight TV, joins me alongside Richard Middleton, Editor at Television Business International. Peter White from Deadline joins us with the latest Hollywood TV industry news as the first scripted show on US soil to restart production kicks off. And K7 Media's Gertz Leases takes us on a whistle-stop tour of the world's production sets and gives us some tips on lessons already learned from TV markets overcoming COVID. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. So before we kick off this week's show, I just wanted to let you know that this week we've launched a number of advertising and sponsorship options on Telecast. Our aim is to keep on investing in the quality of the show and bring in even more great features that you, our listeners, will love. So, if you want to promote your brands, content or services on the international TV industry's fastest growing podcasts, get in touch with me at justin at boomdialogue.com. That's justin at boomdialogue.com to find out more. I'll put that email address in the episode description as well. So my first guest in this week's show is a familiar name on the international TV circuit, especially at MIPCOM. Aaron Malyars is Director of Content and Channels at Insight TV, the world's leading 4K UHD channel. He's responsible for all Insight TV channels, the content that goes on them, and the direction of original content. And Richard Middleton is editor at Television Business International. He leads on all aspects of the market-leading title's editorial business. Richard spent the past seven years covering the global TV business, latterly as editor of C21's flagship magazine, C21 International, and before that he worked for the BBC, amongst others. So welcome to the show, Aaron Malyars and Richard Middleton. How are you doing, guys? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me, Justin. Great, yeah, thanks for the invite. Great to have you on telecast. Aaron, let's start with you. So everyone's seen the very striking Insight TV branding, whether that's actually in the Palais on your booth or, or you know, that very uh, impressive installation that you had outside the Grand Hotel one, MIPCOM, I think it was, a, a couple of years ago. And I think we're, we're all clear on your, your 4K offer as a channel. But can you just bring us up to date on the distribution of Insight TV, how consumers can access Insight TV? Yeah. No, thanks. So that, that, that sounds like it was forever launching inside the video of the Lord of the Grand with like that, that big statue. And, uh, you know, it, it's good that you refer to it because uh, everyone is still talking about that and also our shock at NetB, but it feels like forever. It's good that you asked like the, the question on the 4K and the positioning. Um, so because we have changed a little bit, uh, when we started, it was more like 4K was the pillar. Uh, along the way, we positioned ourselves more from a brand and content perspective uh, we're we're focusing on the millennial generation, and you know our tagline is here to tell a story. So it's all about telling a story, uh, unscripted from uh, from the communities where we find interesting stories around the world, whether that's you know street art, football, or esports these days. Uh, it's all about you know fresh, creative, new content, new formats, uh, but you know shot in 4K UHD HDR. So I always envision you know the editorial, the creative needs to be leading. Uh, the show needs to be interesting, and when that happens, you know we can even we can add on. By the way, and it's also in the highest quality. Uh, but the story and, and and the creative needs to be there in the first place. Yeah. So that that's the brand positioning some more of the channel um, along the way. So we have we have our main flagship is indeed our 4K USD HDR uh, 4K channel 24/7 delivered via um, satellite to uh, um, to cable operators. The the second thing we also have our HD channel. Uh, the business model there is obviously advertising on GRP basis. Uh, the third one, and that's an interesting trend. It's you know everyone calls it a little bit different. It's a uh, without name like digital linear streams basically. So in the US, uh, the trend started in the US with Samsung TV Plus, which is basically an app on your TV, but it's pre-installed and always goes back to to that kind of application. Uh, and you have all kinds of channels, I believe 120 channels now, delivered via IP, uh, but still linear schedule. Yeah. Uh, and that's a free service, but that's been taken off massively. That will be 
know, more into the future because a lot of other platforms are also starting or continuing these kind of services like uh, Pluto TV uh, or Visio with their with, with their with their same similar service. Um, and we have, you know, we've seen Amazon will start one of those services right now. And the interesting thing there is that we always thought like there is no place for linear TV anymore in the world. But uh, we sometimes, I think we confused the demise of television or linear TV with that people don't like to pay those cable bills anymore. Because if you look at the uptake, the millions of views we are getting on our channel every month on a linear basis uh, on some of those services actually shows that, you know, people still like to come home, switch on the TV, let something run, do maybe something else, and then sit back and relax while they're getting content getting served. Uh, and then, of course, then they go into, like, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll watch a movie and then yeah. I'll go into the Netflix or Amazon of the of the world. But uh that's a really thing, um, interesting distribution model for us right now. So, so you, so it's linear. You're available through linear through apps on uh, on smart TVs, but you're also available through smartphones. Yes, yeah, yeah we have our um, uh, asphalt model inside TV, where everyone in the world can can watch uh, our series there for um, uh, for an amount. Uh, to be really, really honest, we're you know we're not marketing that heavily, uh, but it is there for when people like to you know they can they can. Inside TV might not be available in certain territories, but because of our social media influencers, if you would like to have a buzzword there, uh, they do come across uh, our channel and our promotions, and they do like to watch some of the content. And of course, if you're aiming for a millennial or younger generation, you need to be found online somewhere as well. Yeah. Uh, and that's where the apps and the, and the platform come in. Yeah. And, and talking about global influencers. So you describe your content as vivid stories about trending communities through global influences. So I was watching a show last night on uh, on the app about street art in Ibiza. And I have to say, look, it did look fantastic, you know, the quality uh, that came over on, on the smartphone. What's your content strategy in terms of commissioning and acquiring content? We try to commission most of our shows. It's becoming, with, with this current pandemic, a little bit more difficult on the budget side. So we're also, you know, continuing starting up co-production, but maybe later, more on that later. Uh, to come back to your question, content strategy, if you take your example of the Street Art Challenge show, of course, I'm happy that you're saying the images look great, but the story, I hope, was also really intriguing because I really like that show from the fact that we were putting two different street artists or street uh, graffiti artists, uh, so like one from one part of the world and the other one from the other one, and we both combine them in Ibiza, and they have to create together an artwork. So what is going to happen, let's say, you know, you are more into... Uh, cubics, for instance, that your style and my style is a lot of colors. So somehow we need to come up with something for that community to create together. Looking for a, a clash of artistic temperament there. E exactly. And all of those you know, characters are pretty you know, um, uh, interesting and they have a strong opinion uh, and they're young. So it's like the, the, the combination together with art is something where, you know, on the digital side, but also in social media and I think in our daily lives, street art makes, makes total sense to actually... Um, uh, uh, do a show on uh, just go on the content strategy uh, we have something within our our company is called inside tv labs where we research every topic and how big the topic and what kind of future it has yeah so of course you know we did a show on esports which, which is like the one of the most booming things uh, over the past few few years uh it was a, a challenge because we didn't want to go into like those dungeons and only film people there so it's always about the story you know what is like what is driving these people and what is their story and how um how does it fit into the more global uh scenery of yeah. of of that uh, that community um so to, to go through the green light process you know we're we're, we're checking um who is the talent where they resonate what is the topic where does that resonate so uh that's how we determine future shows okay you say you you like to commission most of your content. Can you give us a, an idea of how many hours that is a year? So we're aiming to do um, uh, 200 hours per year to produce. Uh, of course, during this pandemic, it's a little bit more difficult to reach that amount of hours. And of course, yeah, you know, sometimes uh, happens, things happen in production here and there where you don't meet that. But that's what we're striving for, yeah. Okay. And presumably now how the pandemic has affected your business. How have you found that affecting viewing? figures both on linear and your rest for channel so uh, i think across the board everyone has seen that the viewing figures during pandemic were were you know skyrocketing yeah. uh, some of our viewership doubled or even tripled uh 
weekly and even even monthly. Wow. Um, so that has been great. Uh, the downside, especially in you know February, March, and April, was that the advertisers weren't there. So yeah, because everyone put a hold on their marketing budget, with, which you know affects the uh, the, the ad spend. Um, but in May, we already saw like a like a, a growth figure again. Um, and also for June, if I look at some of the dashboards, it's looking promising again that we're moving in the right direction. Okay. In terms of your commissioning strategy, hopefully that's starting to pick up in different places around the world now, the the ability to, to produce as we come out of lockdown. How is that going to affect the channel when we come to sort of six months' time, you know, in terms of what's going to be playing out? I mean, are you going to be looking to acquire 4K HD content when we may have a shortage of, of new original content in six months' time? So it, that's always been the difficulty for us because we, our 4K standards, 4K HDR standards are so high that it's difficult to find content. There is content out there, uh, but it's always like really beautifully shot nature or um, you know space from above or something, which is great, but we are trying to tell a story. Uh, so it needs to be storytelling. It needs to be engaging for, for our target audience. Um, to look at you know four or five months ahead, we did finish you know a lot of productions just before lockdown hit. So I, I you know from the looks of it, we should be okay until the end, end of the year with, with big launches. Uh, at the same time, we had a few um, new productions almost starting. Um, I think the challenge for for us now, and I think for the rest of the world, is to to figure out uh, you know which countries are safe. How can we travel here and there? At maybe already in July. To, to do like social distancing shooting uh, or filming to get some of those productions uh, finished um, so we have we have some more on the shelf to to start premiering yeah uh, and even of course you know everyone is scared of you know a, a wave two or a wave three in, in October so we're definitely looking at that maybe you know there are some countries where it's pretty safe to, to film uh, and we can travel in the near future uh, to get some of those productions which are already lined up done in the next few months. So we have some more uh, more uh, runway. Okay. Um, well, really interesting, and and you know, obviously, good luck with everything on Insight TV. As you say, the the stories are very key to what you do, as opposed to purely the the quality of the content from a visual perspective. Of course, thanks, Richard. Welcome to the show. Great to have you on here. We've been trying to get you on for a uh, for a little while, and uh, uh, delighted that uh, that you're with us. TBI Television Business International one of the most established and respected trade media outlets in, in the content industry and, and part of the Informer Group, which is obviously one of the biggest trade show producers around the world. So it must have been a turbulent time for you, particularly over the last three months. Yeah, I think like everyone, it's uh, it's been a, a busy and yeah challenging time. As you say, turbulence uh, has definitely come with with the, the past couple of months. Um, I mean, on a TBI front, we, we moved pretty quickly. Um, we just put out our Mit TV um, edition. So that's still with press. Um, and then after that, it was clear, obviously, that COVID was uh, here to stay for the next uh, foreseeable couple of months at least. So we, you know, we turned all our attention to, to making sure that we provided the best coverage we could on that front. The beauty about TBI is we're very, obviously, internationally facing. So we've been getting insights from all over the world on on sort of how the content industry has reacted and i mean one of the key things that we noticed is the speed at which producers did manage to to, to adapt um obviously for scripted and, and high budget premium drama it's different but you know where producers were working in sort of factual and, and uh, archive they were very very quick to, to turn stuff around make sure that they were um pitching broadcasters uh, there seemed to be a real understanding of the situation very quickly um, on that front. So we've been running lots of pieces uh, from yeah from producers all over the place. We had guys out in Australia writing pieces for us about sort of how they've adapted. They were shooting it. One of them was shooting a show um, in uh, in a zoo in in Sydney, uh, and it was all about sort of how they they weren't allowed in the zoo, so they, they strapped the cameras onto the people who were allowed in the zoo. You know, quick little workarounds like that. Um, so we've yeah we've moved into lots of lots of uh, coverage coverage. We've also launched TBI Talks, yeah, which is our new sort of online discussion um, portal. So getting lots of international execs on. Um, so we've heard from streamers from from, from some of the leading players in the Middle East. We had Bitbox uh, over from the US. We had UK TV, you know, discussing about the opportunities because. 
there has obviously there's been a huge impact in terms of uh, what coronavirus has done to the to the production industry and the content industry as a whole. But there are opportunities emerging. Um, so we've been keen to try and focus on that and and obviously provide as much information as we can um, for for all the you know, production guys, the distribution guys um, who are yeah you know, who are trying to react. And then, as you say, yeah, on the Informer side, so TBIE is part of Informer, which is, as you say, I think probably the world's biggest trade show producer. Yeah. So we have, uh, as a company, they've been deeply affected by, by coronavirus, of course, um, with events being cancelled, etc. cetera. Um, so they've moved a lot of their uh, events into digital versions. Um, I think that's one of the, I mean, that's one of the, real takeaways for me has been the speed at which people have been able to react um and also informer is very much again a very international company you know it has offices all over the world so there's a lot of intel coming in and a lot of intel coming in quite early um you know, informer has a huge business out in china for example so it's yeah kind of the, of the business was affected quite early on so they were able to plan they were able to get funding in place. Uh, and I think I've seen that there's an informer trade event has just taken place actually last week in China. Is that right? Yeah, I think they're getting things back up and running. They're, tr- they're trying to do that. I mean, obviously, it's a very fast moving situation. You know, we saw just a couple of days ago. You know, there was, there was a, another a small outbreak. Um, I think it was in, in, in Beijing. So obviously, it's a very fast moving situation. But I think the, the the company is very well placed to to adapt to those things. Um, and I mean, a lot of the, the revenue as well. It's worth sort of reminding does come from digital as well. So I've got a nice um, on both sides. But certainly, I mean, like everyone here, yeah, it's been a hugely challenging time. Um, but it also, I think it's probably pushed us into ways of working that we probably should have yeah. been working in anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's pushed us into that a little bit earlier. So you know, doing online discussions, seminars, um, things like that. That I think probably we might see that becoming more normal. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, well, it, it's always great to see uh, TBI is always um, obviously recognised for its really great in-depth coverage uh, uh, and feature coverage. So it's, it's, it's been great to see that that coming through over the last last few months. So Aaron, take us through your first story. It's about Water Bear. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that, that's correct. So yesterday I saw the announcement of um, uh, the city of Enterprise and, and of Defence to launch uh, a new you know network or, or channel on um, on nature and um, you know, the environmentally, uh, you know, content. Um, of course, you know, it's, it's interesting to see that there's still people out there launching new platforms, which is great in these initiatives. Uh, the thing why, why I chose the, the article was more in a broader sense that uh, I think it was only six months ago when, you know, that sort of things um, like environmental, you know, getting the the pollution back to uh, to a certain degree to, you know, prolong our life on this planet was the topic in the world. You know, it's like that. That was it. So um, uh, it's interesting to see now, like six months later. You know, we have corona pandemic. Now we, of course, you know, we have the, the, the diversity um, uh, where everyone's jumping on, and we don't know what might be next. Hopefully, nothing. But um, maybe in a few few uh, more months, you now we have we have something else where the world is um, where it's occupied with. So it was more to sh- to show like. Our industry, and I think the media industry, is so uh, of, not vulnerable. Of course, everyone is, but it's so um, yeah, adaptable that there can be so many different topics, so many new trends going on in, in, in six months, maybe a week, or maybe maybe especially a year. That all of these trends, sometimes we see at Mipcom uh, during the week, you know, that's all news the week the week after or two weeks after. So it's really interesting to see. That you know we constantly have have to adapt. You know, I like the, the the story of you know of you, Richard, saying we should do more uh, digital uh, conferences anyway. I think that's a that's a great initiative. We all we all go out and see see different things, but you know trends might change in, in in the next six months. Maybe next year we say when we hopefully have a vaccine and everything turns a little bit more to normal, we actually like to have more face to face meetings more than ever, and no one likes to have you know online conference anymore because they want to see and shake hands and and, and uh, do the personal stuff suddenly. We don't know. And that's what I was trying to say with, with this article. Um, it, it is still a big topic. You know, we need to preserve our the earth for, you know, for, for our future kids. And uh, because of pandemic and other stuff that that being pushed to the background, yeah. it's interesting to see those those trends changing. 
No, absolutely, and and, and you're right. And we, we that is something we we discussed certainly in the earlier episodes of of Telecast about you know the global climate crisis movement was you know really sort of reaching a peak and 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 really starting to get some traction. And then the pandemic hits. Hopefully, when we come out of the pandemic, we're not going to go straight back to those old ways. You know, those old ways of flying too much, driving too much. Um, just become a little bit more conscientious, I suppose, in the way that we we conduct our business and live our daily lives. And I think this, you're right. That, I mean, we've seen Water Bear has been announced, I think it was a couple of years ago uh, or, or 18 months ago. So it's, been, it's certainly been around, and which is obviously an initiative from Off the Fence, uh, ZDF Enterprises owned Off, off the Fence. We still don't know what the, the business model is, do we? We know there's an ability there for... Yeah. Um, consumers to watch the content and to donate to charities which is the one of the unique points about it is that you know you watch a documentary which you might be a greenpeace documentary and then there's the ability it's interactive to the extent that you can actually go straight in there and and, and make a donation um which is which is again a fantastic initiative but um do we know what the business model is in terms of how they're requiring content and is it a subscription-based model do we know yeah, I, I believe it was a it's a free model and it was more connected um, with the partners and the, the the NGOs across the world. They're also helping to make the platform bigger. So the subscribers, you know, I think it, it's free, but then uh, of course we it's more to raise awareness and maybe donations in the end as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I understand. Yeah, maybe we can uh, we can get Alan uh, uh, or one of the team from Off the Fence on the show in a future edition to talk more about Water Bear. But certainly, any initiative that further raises awareness of the issues when it comes to the natural world and climate crisis and keeping that front of mind as we as we come out of that, it can only be a good thing. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Richard, so your first story is about content being pulled from networks around the world in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests. Take us through that. Yeah, obviously we've seen uh, protests, as you say, around the world um, following the, the death of uh, George Floyd while in police custody. Um, we saw some of the biggest media companies coming out to support Black Tuesday. Uh, and since then, we've been seeing some of the, the action that's been taken on screen as well. So probably the biggest biggest news to come out of that at the moment is the, the fact that um, COPS, the, the long-running, uh, I guess you call it a, a ride-along a reality show has been cancelled um, and, and pulled completely from, from Paramount Network, which is a Viacom CBS US cable channel. I mean, it's worth just sort of reflecting a little bit on how, you know, Cops is a long running show. It's been on air for more than three decades, launched in 1989, um, and it was cancelled before. It went, it was on Fox um, previously and then was picked up by Paramount um, after Fox cancelled it in 2013. Uh, but it's worth, yeah, just sort of reflecting on. on you know, this is quite a big US show that, that has been pulled. Um, and it's always, I mean, for the last decade or so, it's probably faced criticism, partly because of the sort of its perceived glorification of police aggression. Um, and it looks like Arkham CBS have basically decided that actually uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just not fit to, to be aired at, at this time or, or in the future. Um, and then obviously we had um, A&E pulling its uh, unscripted police series Live PD. Again, a similar type of show to cops in some ways the interesting thing with these cancellations and especially i mean live pd you know it's on reflection it probably makes absolute sense that it was cancelled but then if you rewind a couple of months they just put a bumper order in for, i think it was 160 episodes from from the producers wow. uh, big fish entertainment so on the one hand you know we're seeing the these big changes from from especially the u.s um, com- media companies we're seeing, you know, these are quite big. Uh, these are quite big changes, and, and I mean, Live PD especially has been a hit show for A&E. It's spawned a couple of um, spin-offs. It, it did really well in the ratings. You know, and the fact that they're now pulling it um, suggests that perhaps there actually is some meaningful action taking place. But it's also worth remembering. You know, this is admirable that they have cancelled it, but there are question marks over whether this show probably should have been on the air. Um, last couple of months um how it moves forwards uh, we wait to see uh you know the unfortunately these sorts of deaths especially in the us but but all over the world the, the sort of uh you know police brutality i guess you call it um it has happened before in the us uh there have been protests about it 
there have been calls for change and people said there will change and, and nothing really has changed that much, some might argue. So it will be interesting to see this time around. You know, we've, we've seen some initial action from the big media players. Um, it will be interesting to see how that develops and, and if this is you know, sustained action and, and there are moves to improve diversity to, to make sure that shows uh, are on, on air that it reflects uh, the population and, and are produced by people um, you know, with, with proper representation behind the camera as well. Um, because I think, I mean, it's, you know, it's been a problem in the content industry, no matter which country you're in, um, for probably forever. Uh, so I'm, I guess we're hoping, yeah, this time it might, uh, we might actually see some, some meaningful change and, and it will be sustained. We've also seen, you know, lots of shows in the UK and I'm sure internationally being pulled as well. We have seen um, Little Britain pulled. We've seen Faulty Towers. We've seen a number of different shows. We're looking through them in a different lens. And, and I think a lot of the producers and uh, talent involved in those shows are perhaps looking at it and thinking, actually, that really wasn't appropriate now, particularly under the uh, looking at it through the current um, current light of day. I also th- I think like, that depends to me a little bit on, on what it is. Um, isn't, I don't think uh, it's a controversial opinion, but I always think like if... Little Britain or, or especially Faulty Towers, if there's humor in it, if there's uh, sarcasm in it or something like, you know, it sparks thinking. I was like, if you rule out humor or, or something like this, the the conversation, you know, might change, you know, without context. You know, there is no, there's always only bad, you know, there's no nuance in the conversation anymore. And I think a lot of those comedians and um a series you need to be strong sometimes to actually make your point um yeah i'm i'm, I'm not i'm not saying you know racist jokes are good but also you know if you some, see some of these stand-up com- comedians um to a certain audience whether that's that's maybe a chinese comedian to chinese people or a black community to the black community you know they're also making um you know strong jokes about about anything where we now think like okay maybe if someone else would have said it it you know definitely is racist so i'm trying to say like humor is a big part of the conversation to make things better sometimes yeah. i think yeah i mean i, I guess satire it, it's you know satire, the, yeah. the ability to make fun of anybody is i suppose many people would see that as being a key pillar of freedom of speech really you 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 know you should be allowed to satirize anybody whether it be government religion whatever it might be so it is a very very interesting topic there's obviously no shortage of views on all sides and obviously a lot of broadcasters and producers are are, are struggling with those issues now so one of the interesting um developments we saw gone with the wind taken off hbo max the new um bike on cbs uh, streamer um and and they subsequently said you know it was taken off because of its racist depictions and, and glorification of slavery um and i think what the way they're going to tackle that is putting it back on the service but have a uh, a historical context uh, piece at the very start of the show so you know i think like you say is you know you can't just pretend gone with the winds never existed you can't pretend that these shows didn't exist uh they were over time obviously and i think the way that some of the um, some of the media companies seem to be looking to approach it is to make it clear that these shows, you know, do contain offensive content and language. Um, I think the Forty Towers is now back on uh, UK TV as well, um, and again, they're going to put sort of an offensive content and language warning up at the front of it. Um, so I think it's important to almost note, you know, you. you there's an awareness, at least, from the broadcasters uh, and streaming companies that perhaps wasn't there before. Um, and that seems to be where they, one of the ways that they're trying to sort of tackle it. And especially with shows like Gone with the Wind, um, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it probably you know, it's, it's an important part of the uh, process that it, that it is there so people can kind of reflect a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important that these new show notices provide that all-important context that I think it's become clear that we need. So, Aaron, your second story is all about dating formats adapting to the times. Take us through that. Yeah, it was, was more um, also, again, in general, than about this specific uh, idea is that um, social distancing in dating formats or Love Island or Temptation Island, how is it going to work in terms of um, how interesting will the show still be? 
because in the end, you know, people are watching for the for the juicy details and the juicy side of it. Yeah. Um, if if that falls through, you know, what what is left uh, with the show? You know, of course, you can maybe you know instigate 14 days quarantine before and 14 days quarantine after uh, after recordings. Um, but I was just more interesting to see like why certain formats are being cancelled and why certain formats are, are going ahead. Um, yeah, it was just interesting to see. Yeah, we had Carlotta Rossi Spencer from Banerjee on a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about Temptation Island. And actually, you know, the fact is they're ready to go on a number of their different international productions of that format. But actually, they're, they're waiting for air travel to come back. That's that's all they're waiting for. They're all being quarantined. They're all ready to go. All the, uh, the the cast and crew are ready. So I guess it's that you know, yeah, it's that quarantine, isn't it? It's that ability to have the cast all ready all packed and in one place and just waiting for, for the for the flights to come back. But uh, but no, you you raise a, a good point in the in the week that yeah. uh, ITV cancelled uh, Love Island as well, Rich. Uh, yeah, we knew about the, the summer cancellation uh, and they left that to the last minute pretty much um, with, with ITV's director of TV, um, Kevin Ligo, sort of admitting that it was, it was going to be a huge commercial decision uh, and, and when they made it, it, it was one of those sort of necessities. But that cancelling the winter version as well means that there's going to be quite a lag. I mean, it's, it's going to be a huge hole in there in ITV2 schedule um, especially. And I mean, the, the format, the UK sort of version of the format at least, has really had a torrid time of it. You know, the, the winter version last year, of course, was hit by the, the tragic death of Caroline Flack. Then we've not had the summer version and, and now the winter version's gone as well. So we're looking at 2021, uh, ITV promising a bigger and better show, but it's going to leave some holes in yeah. some uh, in some budgets. Yeah, massive show. And, and I think they brought Australian Love Island yeah. onto ITV too. Yeah, they have indeed. Yeah, the, the version that aired on uh, Nine in Australia from, I mean, it was originally aired in 2018. So I think you have to be a fairly ardent Love Island fan to, to want to watch that. But. Yeah, I was actually looking at some of the social media around that. And there's, let's say there's a lot of spoilers uh being discussed you know it's a it's i suppose it's a pale imitation of what could have been but uh but you can't blame them right you can't blame itv2 for to, for putting that front and center really no no absolutely and i think i mean it's it'll be interesting to see sort of how banerjee get on with their with their shows and if they you know if they manage to make it happen and it'll be interesting sort of in six months time to look back on that itv decision about winter love island and see if it was the right decision made it's an early call i guess time will tell if it's if it's the right call or not yeah, Aaron, have you ever thought about reality formats for Insight TV? Well, um, we're doing um, adventure reality, but that kind of dating reality is uh, is not for for our DNA um, because of some of the restrictions we have. Yeah. Okay, Richard. So your second story is about a BBC shortfall. Take us through that one. Yeah, this is an interesting one that sort of brings the international uh, side of the business into the UK. So BBC Studios, the international. Um, sales distribution production arm of, of the BBC has obviously been affected like like everyone with COVID-19 outbreaks so it's been unable to produce as many shows and sell as many shows as, as it normally would so a couple of weeks back it, it alluded to the fact that it was probably going to have to reduce its contribution to the, the BBC in the UK and it emerged just recently that um, they're actually going to cancel their dividend altogether. I mean last year that dividend stood at 65 million pounds which is just uh, just north of 80 million dollars and it's kind of this drip drip effect of impacts on the on the bbc in the uk so they've already had to postpone uh, some job cuts which are going to save money they've already had to postpone the cancellation of free licenses for over 75 year olds in the uk um, which again is going to cost money um, so we've seen the bbc it's done extremely well during during the pandemic it's been sort of the go-to broadcaster reaffirmed itself at the centre of the UK media landscape and built itself up a lot of goodwill um, against a government that perhaps might well attack it in, in the weeks and months and years to come. But at the same time, it is storing up problems for the future because it's going to have quite a big deficit to make up. And it's, it's going to be intriguing to see where it makes up that, that, that saving because it's going to have to make it at some point. Um, it can't just keep, you know, postponing its uh, its budget cuts. Yeah. 
or challenges for the new director general who's just been installed a few days ago. He's got a, a pretty big inbox to deal with, not least the wrangling with the government about all sorts of funding issues. Fascinating story. And, you know, we're going to see some cuts, aren't we? We're going to see some cuts, surely channel wise. I mean, we've talked about BBC Four, BBC Three coming back, BBC Four perhaps uh, disappearing. Any other clues on what, what they might? look to to save money going forward so look, yeah as you say bbc4 channel brand is, is certainly under pressure and, and the interesting thing with that was the, the fact that it's it's editor cassian harrison is working at bbc studios the commercial arm, and they've alluded to the fact that they're going to potentially launch bbc4 as a as a sort of svod streamer internationally we've now got the bbc studios boss going to become the bbc director general so, you know, we've got a lot of sort of, there's a lot of commercially minded people at the top of the BBC in the UK now. Uh, and it would be, I mean, a lot of the, the signs point to the fact that, you know, the BBC is going to have to be very canny in the way it spends its money and very canny in the way it generates its money. Um, and it's now got the person who knows most about sort of the BBC's value internationally at the top of its UK based uh, organisation. So I think there are lots of interesting plans probably in the works. Um, they've got you know, lots of strategy documents that, I've spoken to, to execs over there, and there, there are certainly yeah there, there are plans uh, in the works. I think, and it will be fascinating to see how Tim Davy deals yeah with the political pressure um, and also the, the funding pressures, which are which are inevitably going to come, and increasingly the, the way that the BBC Studios is used as a, as a conduit to the rest of the world to generate money. If that license fee that, that BBC is so used to does come to an end or turn into some sort of subscription model. Uh, well, I guess now more than ever, we talked about crisis bringing on change and accelerating change. And, and I guess we're going to see that not only in lots of different commercial companies, but the BBC and, and, and its commercial arms as well. So it's, uh, as you say, it's going to be fascinating to see and no doubt something we're going to be talking about at length as we go forward on telecast. <laughs> So it's the time of the show where we get to nominate your hero of the week and who you're going to be telling to get in the bin. So, Aaron, who's your hero of the week? Yeah, so it was in general, right? So it's uh, it's not not someone from from the business. It was more something which sparked the news over a couple of days. Uh, it was Patrick Hutchinson from uh, the guy who actually carried um, the against Life Matter protests as the white guy out of the. Uh, pretty difficult situation it brought him to safety of course that act you know is is a uh, is remarkable by its own uh, i also like the fact that he said like of course you know i like you know I, I needed to save this man you know to save his life the other thing is also he he prevented from he prevented the change in narrative uh, in a protest from black lives matter and but you know they kill other people that he stopped that he stopped that feeling right there because if that if, if that man actually died by, by Black Lives Matter protesters, it becomes a totally different conversation. So he did, without knowing it himself, he did a lot of, for, for that initiative to, to stay, uh, yeah, I would say, sane and, and honest. Yeah, that's right. There's a fantastic interview with him, actually, that I'll put a link in the, in the description of the podcast to, uh, uh, that he talks about, you know, what happened and what drove him to rescue this. I mean, we don't know if he was a far right sympathizer yeah. a lot of people expect he was but uh, there was certainly an altercation between black lives matters and suspected far right extremists and as you say this one guy was set upon and uh and, and our hero and his friends a group of them actually came together and, and yeah they protected the you know him when, well he was carrying a guy yeah. away and also i would love to do you know maybe you can do that um uh, justin love to do an interview with with the guy who was actually a res- rescue what his mind or thoughts are, you know, from that perspective, now he, he went through this. Uh, that's really, would be really interesting yeah, to hear. Absolutely right. Well, uh, hopefully, if he is somebody that, you know, one of the hooligans that, that, that came down to London with nothing other than their minds and causing trouble, then hopefully it did change his mind. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure seeing that act played out, you know, across media globally not only in the uk uh will we'll hopefully change a, a few other people's minds as well yeah so uh well no absolutely we can uh, we can certainly agree with your hero of the week there um richard who's your hero of the week uh well my hero of the week of the past couple of months uh i'm going to say paddling pools parks and green spaces right um 
paddling pools had kept me saying, well, a paddling pool has kept me saying, I've got a four year old boy who during lockdown was uh, very energetic, as four year old boys tend to be. Um, and the paddling pool kept him sane and entertained and fairly enclosed. Um, so, in the, you know, as lockdown sort of come down around the world and we're a little bit freer now in the UK, uh, I'd like to, yeah, put forward my paddling pool um, as a, a savior and something that allowed me to keep working from home. Uh, to some degree of efficiency um so yeah paddling pool is for, the one for me yeah i think anybody who's got an outside space any sort of outside space during this lockdown is is blessed really um and i think it, it only makes you think of people who are less fortunate you know and, and and who have been cooped up in you know flats without without outdoor spaces it, it must be really difficult and you're right parks you know, it comes to it gets us to think about you know our outdoor space and how valuable they really are. Nobody, you know, everyone takes parks in the cities for for granted, but um, they've really come into their own now. And uh, as long as you're two meters apart from everybody else, uh, it's quite, kind of quite interesting. Our local park has uh, has got all these new pathways across it. It's like zigzag. It's like a spider's web of people uh, think, yeah. uh, trying to avoid each other. Yeah, definitely. I think those, those green spaces and those parks, especially yeah, this, the past couple of months, deserve uh, a lot of recognition and, and people look after them. And, and yeah, perhaps takes them to come as you know the, the, the joys of working from home and, and there's some challenges as well. So yeah, that's a good one. And Aaron, who or what are you telling to get in the bin? Yeah, I, I, I think we, we touched upon it a little bit earlier already, but um, uh, for me, it was indeed again you know to the to the diversity conversation. It was the BBC who actually we were removing. Uh, the episode of the Germans from Faulty Towers uh, because of some of the things that were said there. Yeah, I, I think you know I, I made my point earlier saying, um, yeah, if, if you take out humor and satire in the, con- out the conversation, it becomes very bland. And um, I think the conversation will be stuck. You know, it, it, it doesn't move ahead. And also to look at some of these iconic episodes like this, um, it was actually to raise a point on 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 racism and, and and stuff like that, um, instead of you know you know advocating it, and certainly John Cleese gave his uh, opinion yesterday about about the BBC pretty strongly, that you know, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I do sympathise with that uh, to a to a degree. It is more it, it's something else to at least strategically look at things down the line instead of making these sudden changes. I think it needs to be a, a needs to have a little bit more thought before you do something like that. But that's uh, again my my opinion, and and I believe that's now been reinstated, hasn't it, on the UK yeah. TV? Yeah, with a warning. Yeah, with a warning yeah. now. So um, so I think uh, which actually proves the point. It actually proves the point of uh, of John Cleese and some of us saying, you know, people are just some of the companies are just doing it to to you know protect themselves. Of course, you need to do that, but to a certain degree, I would I would say. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I completely agree. I think there's. I mean, we've seen in the past, you know, media companies are very quick to sort of get on bandwagons and, and you know, portray themselves as, portray themselves as very virtuous. Uh, what we want to see this time is some, some actual, you know, meaningful change and sustained change, not, not, uh, you know, yeah, as Aaron sort of alluded to, sort of, um, you know, change that, that perhaps doesn't persist. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And Richard, who or what are you telling to get in the bin this week? Um, I'm going to tell Britain First to get in the bin, um, which is a far-right organisation. Quite a few of their members, if you can call them members, went down to the uh, to, to the UK capital, London, to to, um, to cause trouble, as you said earlier, basically. Uh, you know, Black Lives Matter has raised a really important uh, discussion point. Uh, and the protests, you know, whether or not they should be going on under lockdown or whatever, um, they've created a... a, a, a uh, discussion and and there is you know, there's a bit of two way going on about what needs to change for the, for the betterment of everyone um, and Britain first and, and the far right by you know pretending that they're defending you know statues of Winston Churchill and the cenotaph it's it's just reprehensible um, there is uh, there's just no place I don't think for them in, in the UK um, you know we need to have proper discussions about how things need to change. Um, as Aaron sort of said earlier, yeah, Patrick Hutchinson, you know, perfect portrayal sort of to counter everything that Britain First stand for. Um, so, yeah, my get in the bin will be Britain First and hopefully they'll stay there. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it sadly reminds me of all of the times when we've seen international football tournaments in England playing 
all over the world and you know um hundreds because it's not more than that it's just a few hundred hooligans that have decided to come together and cause trouble and that's it and you can't see any of those followers certainly not from the evidence that we saw in tv uh that anybody had any sort of reasonable argument they were clearly planning to get drunk and cause trouble and 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 you know who knows what their real motivation is but uh but quite right. And, uh, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing, I think, for Britain on the world stage to to have people like that call their organization Britain first, because uh, certainly, you know, the, the, I don't think any right minded person would want to associate, you know, the country or or the Union Jack or anything like that with uh, with with people like that. Well, thanks very much, Aaron and Richard, for joining this week. It's been fantastic to have you on the show. Um, really interesting points, uh, as ever. Um, so it's, it's been brilliant to, to speak to you, and uh, and we hope to see you again in person before too long. Thank you very much. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Justin. So it's that time in the show where we head over to Hollywood and catch up with Peter White from Deadline. How you doing, Peter? Hey, Justin. I'm good. Yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad, actually. It's uh, it's been sunny in London this week, so uh, you know the, the the sun's returned. It's never gone away in LA, has it? It hasn't. No, it hasn't. And we've been able to to enjoy it a little bit more uh, over the last week. I went to a real life restaurant uh, this weekend, which was a uh, which was a bit of a buzz. First time in a in a few months. So yeah, we're. Uh, we're starting to enjoy some of the things like that. A real, a real life restaurant. I can only dream about <laughs> things like that in London. But um, we'll get there. We'll get there. Well, we're we're all living vicariously through anybody that has access to a restaurant. So, uh, <laughs> so I hear that their scripted production has restarted in the US. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, we've uh, we've been talking about reopening Hollywood since uh, since you started this show, Justin. So uh, it's uh, it's interesting to have uh, some actual news. Um, not the not the buzziest title in the world, but the Bold and the Beautiful is the uh, is the first scripted series to uh, to be back in production. In fact, started yesterday, uh, Wednesday, which is Wednesday, June seventeenth, uh, here in LA in Television City. Um, you know, it's obviously a daytime soap, but but it's uh, it's really interesting how they're they're doing it. I mean, a lot of this stuff is is things people expected. You've got all of the COVID nineteen safety protocols. You've got there's a a coordinator who's going to be on set all the time, and and the crew members are, are going to wear masks. And you know, there's obviously lots of safety guidelines. Um, but it's interesting that they've been able to get this back up and running. Um, one of the one of the things that has has it's caused a little bit of a slowdown in this is that actually they need to, the producers need to, to reach agreements with the Hollywood guilds before anyone can get actually back on set. So, so they've done that. Um, they've tested the cast and crew and, and they're going to keep doing that. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the shooting days will be slightly shorter and they've talked about staggered call times and, and smaller cast on set at, at each time. But, uh, but yeah, things are, things are moving. So we'll see if, uh, if that gives any uh, any indication with some some of the bigger shows, but but you certainly see with the the, the, the broadcast networks looking at, at full premieres for a lot of shows that they're hoping that they can they can do the same um, on the on the non scripted side. I, I I did a big uh, big piece last week that looked at, at some of uh, the shows like Got Talent and Love Island on CBS, which uh, is likely to happen in the states, even though it's not going to happen in in Britain this year. Okay. And, and 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 looking at from that side of things, which, which will be interesting. There's a lot of talk of, you know, quarantine reality shows. You'll see Love Island, you know, people will be in that bubble. Um, same goes for, for the ba- Bachelorette, which, um, which ABC is going to do under, under quarantine. Um, and, uh, and we're so, yeah, so we're sort of moving in, moving in that direction. I think July and August are going to, are going to be big, uh, busy times for producers. Yeah. It just shows you how important those soaps, those daytime dramas, and the reality shows are for networks around the world because, you know, they are there. As Gertz was talking about in one of his earlier appearances on the podcast, they're almost like the lighthouse, aren't they? They're the, they define the channel. So it's the, And those are the ones that they're desperate to get back on as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely. They, and, you know, they might not be the sexiest things in, in the world, but they, uh, they definitely provide a, a backbone to the schedules. And, and right now that's, uh, that's what people need. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and Neighbours is, is is coming back, I think, in uh, in July in EastEnders as well. So uh, we're seeing all of that picking up around the, the world. That's interesting. Well, that's good. And, and maybe it's a pointer as well in terms of the way that they're going to manage the production, as you say, for those bigger scripted dramas that, uh, yeah. to, you know, to start starting them getting in, back into production as well. Another interesting aspect to it is, is the Americans uh, are looking around the world. They're looking to places that, that have done this successfully. You mentioned Australia there. Obviously, things in Scandinavia have, uh, have come back a little bit quicker. So, uh, you know, the Americans aren't necessarily known for, for taking taking lessons from, from around the world other than uh, a few formats here and there. But, but yeah, I think, you know, you're looking at um, some of the shows, Ninja Warrior or, on NBC, is, is they're looking at how they do that in Germany, uh-huh. for instance, which I don't think they probably would have done beforehand. So, uh, and the same goes for, for some of the scripted, uh, scripted titles. So. All right. So yeah, I think that the, the world uh, world is is going to stay global as uh, as this pandemic uh, rages yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's uh, that's really interesting stuff. And also, we talked and we've been talking about the upfronts or or the upfronts that were or maybe weren't over the last few weeks. We talked about the CW picking up English language shows last week, and there's some more movement on that side this week. Yeah, they're still going. Um, fair play to to the CW. Last last week they had Devils. They had. Uh, the Patrick Dempsey show, uh, you had the Canadian show, uh, Coroner, Dead Pixels, which was the British British comedy. Um, and they've just announced four more, which um, these are things that I, I'll be honest, I, I'm very surprised they weren't necessarily on a list of shows I would have watched out for. Uh, Taskmaster probably being the being the biggest one. They haven't exactly said which season. I, I'm going to guess it's the, the most recent UK TV season. But um, but actually, they've got so many of those that they might might take one from some of the, an earlier an earlier run with with maybe high profile stars so so we'll watch out for that there's um, an itv2 show called killer camp which uh, comes from tuesday's child which um part of the greenbird world uh, the sort of horror competition series um you've got a, a docu series being ruben uh, which is features this uh, this youtuber um and a, another canadian reality show a, a cooking competition called fridge wars right which uh, does exactly what it says on the tin, I think. Um, but it just—it's it, interesting that they're 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 continuing to go in this way. This these shows will be for their their summer schedule, um, la- launching largely in in end of July and, and the begin, beginning of August. Um, you know, they've they've moved a lot of their their originals towards the end of the year and, and next year, so they're they're filling up. So it'll be interesting to see if they've got any more any more plans for this or whether that's it. But, uh, but yeah, I certainly think for British producers, Canadian producers uh, and distributors, there's, uh, there's definitely been more, more sales than yeah. I can certainly remember to, to the American networks. Uh, you know, you, you used to always write, write about these things as an anomaly, but, uh, but the CW uh, has certainly picked up a few more. And, and you never know, uh, depending on what happens over the next few months, the likes of, of NBC, ABC and, uh, and CBS might, might join them if they, they have any holes. Uh, you know, there were some... Some discussion today. ABC launched their their schedule. They sort of explained where where shows were were going to sit in in the next lineup. And uh, uh, and Carrie Burke even sort of said she was open to the idea of the Mandalorian uh, Disney Plus show going on oh. on ABC. So so you know I know that's in house, but it just sort of points to they are thinking ahead in terms of what gaps they might need to fill. Yeah. And, and if there's more British shows that are done and in the can that that might not have uh, not, might not have aired in the states, then then. So be it. Yeah. So uh, good news for, for for those companies. Well, it's going to be interesting to see actually in some of these networks that you know what has previously been a very tightly defined channel brand that shows a particular type of show that hits particular demographics now taking shows that would never have dreamed of you know three four months ago and it's going to be interesting to see how they can you know really keep their own definition of their own brand if you like yeah. going forward through this. Um, Especially if they're taking these shows that maybe will dissipate that brand that they've that they've built up. I think that's why the CW has been at the front of this because they have this this younger skewing identity which fits a little bit more, particularly with the likes of ITV Two and, and E Four. So they 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 have a bit more of a kinship there, whereas I think that the other networks don't really have that same same thing with the British channels like bbc and itv and, and channel four so it, it would seem a little bit odd but but even the cw is doing that you you know i think we said this last week with with devils because that's a much older skewing show you know patrick dempsey you know it's uh 
for, for a slightly older and female audience, um, which isn't really what the CW does, but it's a finished show with an A-list star. So they'll, so they'll, they'll have that as well as some of the stuff with, with YouTubers. So I, I think they're, they're, they're worried less about the, the idea of brand identity um, over the next few months. And they just really want to entertain people. So I think that's going to be the, the first thing. And, and when, when things go back, they'll, they'll probably worry about that a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Peter, thanks as ever. Really interesting catching up. Um, enjoy the restaurants. Enjoy the California life. Um, <laughs> and uh, we look forward to catching up with you same time next week. Thanks, Justin. I'm off to watch the Premier League on NBC. So uh, so that'll be a bit of a... Premier League's back. Football's back all over Europe as well. So uh, so that's that's going to be great to see, uh, to see Leeds win promotion. And maybe <laughs> Liverpool win the Premier League as well, finally. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Speak to you soon. Thanks, Justin. So we've reached that time in the show to catch up with K7 Media's Gertz Lesis. Gertz, how are you? I'm uh, very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, another week in lockdown. Still, uh, still surviving. Well, exactly. Don't say surviving. We have opportunities as well. We do have opportunities. <laughs> Look, that's, that's absolutely right. So you've been gazing into your TV tea leaves. This week, I was trying. Yeah, I was trying hard. Since uh, yeah, since we are seeing more new activity emerging back in studios and on production sets, I thought I would just bring you on a quick tour around the world today, giving some update on what's happening and perhaps what's uh, some broader context, the lessons already learned or the practices that might be useful to know and perhaps adapt elsewhere. Fantastic. Okay, well, that's what we all need, a world tour of, of the TV production landscape. All right. <laughs> okay, let's go. So to start with, I don't want to call it a trend yet, but what I find quite a paradox actually is that following these months of being locked at homes after which one would expect that everybody must be thirsty to just get somewhere outside enjoy the summer as much as it's possible and try to forget about everything that reminds of some kind of lockdown. One of the first shows we see emerging in production in various countries is Big Brother or uh, other shows with a similar premise. In Australia, for instance, Big Brother has been brought back after uh, several years break. It launched last week on 7 and supercharged the broadcaster's time slot by 55% week on week brought in younger audience and beat not just some shows on the other networks airing in the same slot, but two of the biggest reality giants, The Voice and MasterChef. Wow. I have, yeah, that's crazy. And I have already mentioned before about the record high interest to join the Big Brother house in Finland, for instance. But also the show is coming back in Israel and some other countries. And in Spain, they are at least um, providing an alternative for participants to kind of migrate between a house and a garden. Telecinco launched a new primetime reality last week called The Safe House, La Casa Fuerte, in which seven famous couples live in a villa, but are divided into two groups, those who have a bedroom inside the house and those who must camp in the garden. And those in the house must take part in a series of different challenges uh, to earn money, while those in the garden must try and overthrow those in the house and take their place, whilst also having to carry out all the chores. <laughs> and it's up to the audience to vote whether a resident couple deserves to stay in the house or be replaced by one living in the garden. And this show has also launched very, very strongly with a 22% share. And then, of course, another element that can be easily added to the living together in a house setting is dating. And as you may remember me mentioning before, that's another genre where we see a huge interest from potential participants in various markets. So I think it's not surprising that shows like Singletown are starting to fly as well. A new commission has been recently announced uh, for Discovery Networks in Norway, which is casting um, already. And shooting is expected to take place in Oslo in July. And it is interesting to know that this production is going to replace X on the Beach, which is a very popular show in Norway already, but can't be filmed currently due to the COVID restrictions. And for those who don't know, Singleton is uh, basically a should I stay or should I go type of relationship show in which five couples press pause on their partnerships and enjoy a summer of, as singletons going on dates while living together with the other four of a similar fate before making that big decision. It's very flexible, scalable, fast turnaround. It doesn't require traveling and it provides 
fun escapist viewing and particularly attracting younger audiences. I think it's a formula that I believe many channels must be trying to crack at the moment. Yeah, not only channels, but probably distributors as well, right? Yes, 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 definitely. As I've said before, particularly now, it's very important for distributors of existing formats to be flexible and see beyond the format description and trust the local producers and channels when they propose a certain twist, as long as it doesn't contradict with the very DNA of the format, of course. One good example and yet another very fast turnaround idea has been achieved in uh, Italy, where Rai Uno last Sunday already premiered the Norwegian hit format Top 10, which is a studio-based primetime entertainment show airing live in an Italian version. And the original format sees two teams of two celebrities compete uh, to uncover the top 10 hits of a given year, while artists from the year in question are interviewed and all top 10 songs are performed. But in Italy, the format has been tweaked to include different popular cultures' top 10s alongside the music hits, such as film or TV shows, for instance. And the first episode became the most watched uh, show in Italy on Sunday night. Mm. Music is, of course, also a, a universal language. And a new musical talent show has just launched also in Netherlands. It's called uh, We Want More and features talent from any musical background trying to impress the jury. And the twist here is that the jurors are able to vote up until the very last second of the performance, but they can also take away vote at any time. Another thing is that I think it's very, very encouraging and sends a very positive signal to others that there are broadcasters which dare to commit to production of new big formats currently, like Germany's ProSieben, which has just announced a July launch uh, date for a show called Watch. Um, it's a variety meets game show format in uh, which two teams of four um, must watch a high-class variety act uh, before trying to win money by remembering as many details as possible about the show they just watched. And another thing, uh, there is, of course, still a very thin line, uh, not only in respect to what can be produced, particularly in a studio, but also how audiences are actually going to react. In uh, Chile, for instance, the local TV dance competition show Dancing for the Dream by Lando Por and Sunyenyo uh, has received thousands of complaints since returning to air a couple of weeks ago as the viewers have been complaining about the show bringing a false feeling of returning to normality, as well as a lack of masks and nonconformity with social distancing. So it just reminds us once again that the role of television is to be seen also as setting and adhering to the standards which are expected from the rest of the population. Interesting. So does that mean that audiences prefer a real reality as opposed to like a, a fantasy reality? It's it's very well put, I think, actually. The pandemics obviously are going to influence the programming for many more months, even if we are saying that we don't want to see anything virus related anymore. And I think we can expect different consumer shows emerging, for instance, testing everything from hotels and shops to restaurants and spas and how prepared they are for post-COVID business, for example. We will also continue seeing different advice and DIY ideas related to this reality, at least to some extent. In the Netherlands, for instance, a holiday-related consumer show, Max Holidayman, has returned with, with an aim to answer the many questions viewers have around travel this summer. And I think the crisis has also opened our eyes in respect to people who have been working in the front line of the pandemics. And we can expect more shows looking into their uh, daily lives. Like uh, in Belgium, for instance, Flemish um, celebrities are going to experience what it takes to be a nurse as they will go through an intensive training before getting fully immersed into the life of nursing with early starts, night shifts and unpredictable patient care. But we also have to recognize the various creative, even uh, fun solutions found during the pandemics, like, like fishing bingo in Denmark, for instance, having 90 numbered anglers fishing at the same time. And when one of the anglers catches a fish, that number is drawn in a bingo competition for the viewers who play along at home. Fishing bingo. Yeah. Fishing bingo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. I'm, I'm going straight onto YouTube to see if I can find uh, any clips of fishing bingo from Denmark. <laughs> this current situation, it doesn't fail to amaze all these yeah. amazing new formats and creatives that are coming through. Absolutely. And yes, uh, and it is also interesting to notice how even public broadcasters have started to quickly adapt to the actual viewing habits, like co-viewing, for example. 
like Dutch Popcaster NPO, which has added a new feature to its VOD player, allowing several people to watch a show together remotely in a virtual living room created using their webcams. And then, of course, I have to mention the solidarity and sharing of the best practice and know-how that has emerged from this crisis on a totally new level. And in some cases, it has even developed into new promising business ideas, like in Brazil, where an OTT provider has recently launched a new VOD platform in collaboration with various uh, cinema chains. It's called Cinema Virtual. Uh, it is entirely dedicated to film premieres, offering films which had not been released in cinemas due to pandemics. And a certain percentage of the revenues received from subscriptions and movie rentals on this platform is going back to cinema chains. So you see, there are many more um, initiatives worth talking about, of course, particularly with uh, some pretty big uh, scripted projects restarting production already. So I think I better have the scripted review for the next week as the situation is obviously changing quite rapidly. All right. Well, that's uh, that sounds fantastic. We haven't actually looked at scripted uh, for a few weeks. So I think that's a, for quite be, a while. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be a great time to uh, to go back and see see what's happening in that area. So um, Gertz, as ever, fantastic overview Thank you for taking us on a world tour of TV production and what's happening. There's obviously some really creative ideas happening out there. I'm going to go and look at some uh, fishing bingo now. So, um, <laughs> so fun. Yeah. So uh, thanks again, Gertz. Uh, look forward to hearing from you on Scripted next week. See you next week. Take care. Well, that's about it for this week's show. Thanks for listening. And please rate and subscribe to the show and share it with friends and colleagues. If you want to hear more about our advertising and sponsorship packages, please email justin at boomdialogue.com. That's justin at boomdialogue.com. We'll be back with another show next week. So in the meantime, stay safe.